Okay, uh, welcome once again to the Praise and Worship course. Um, hope you all are doing well. Congratulations, you have uh, survived for so long. Uh, all right, before we go ahead, uh, can I request Anita, if you don't mind, could you just start us off with a word of prayer, please? Sure, Pastor. Uh, Father God, we praise you, we worship you, Lord. And this morning, we gathered here, here, here in your presence, Lord. I would like to ask you to bless each one of you, each one of us, Lord. Thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for everything that you had done in our lives, Lord. Thank you for each one of us, Lord. As you are learning your word, Lord, help us to understand that, Lord. Help us to worship you, Lord, and help us to glorify your holy name, Lord. As we all are learning your word, Lord, help us each one of us one of us to have, uh, apply that in our life, Lord, and uh, walk according to that, Lord. Mm, I would like to give Pastor Roshni into your hand, Lord, as he is teaching us, Lord, help him, Lord. And thank you for everything, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Anita. Uh, right in the previous classes, we uh, talked on, we completed the chapter on uh, moving prophetically in praise and worship. It moving prophetically in the praise and worship. Uh, if you have to just quickly recap that chapter for us before we go ahead. Um, we In that chapter, we cover about the connection between music and worship and uh, the connection between the music and the prophetic. Right? And then we look at uh, the music, the prophetic, and the worship where all these three elements meet in the tabernacle of David. He understood a little background of the importance of the tabernacle of David, how he went about uh, setting it up. Uh, there was order, there was proper administration. It was very well planned, right? Um, so we looked at that. Uh, we saw how, how many singers and musicians were uh, were placed, right? Were assembled in the tabernacle of David and, and how it kind of um, mirrors or reflects the new covenant where there is no veil for people to come in. You know, it was available for all to see. Uh, it was beautiful. It must have been a beautiful setting. And um, in from Acts chapter 15, we see that God, kind of, uh, you know, mentioning that he will rebuild the tabernacle of David. Um, and he's continuing to do so. Uh, and then we begin to uh, study on the characteristics of a prophetic word, right? A characteristics of a prophetic word. Uh, just to uh, quickly recap, some of them was a uh, prophetic word can come to us as an impression in our heart, a quickening of the scriptures, a knowing on the inside, pictures, a word, sentence, paragraph, physical sensations, etc. right? And some of you even shared uh, your experiences on how this prophetic word came to you and what you felt, et cetera. Right? Um, so those are the, some, some of the characteristics of the prophetic word and uh, what it does, right? what a prophetic word does, it, it brings edification, it reveals God's plans and purposes. It stirs up and causes us to move in faith, provides motivation and strength to carry on, releases God's power, brings correction and restoration, transforms nation. And then we see that the prophetic word is released as a prophetic song in worship. It accomplishes all that the prophetic word accomplishes, all of everything that we um, kind of went through. Right? The importance of the prophetic song, uh, the importance of a new song, and, some, and basically, we completed the chapter by going through some of the practical guidelines uh, you know, of the prophetic worship. And just to, um, and the, the, one of the most important uh, practical guideline or the way how you can prepare yourself is uh, spending time with the Lord, uh, building, your in, building an intimate relationship with Him. There is no substitute. There is no alternate. Uh, there is no shortcut uh, to that uh, for everything in life, um, especially when it comes to hearing from him, moving in the prophetic. Uh, um, yeah, that you know, there's there is no substitute to it. Okay, um, so that's how we concluded 
the chapter on moving prophetically in praise and worship. But I also thought, uh, you know, I play another video. Uh, it's just another 30 minutes of teaching on the prophetic worship. I thought I'd play that for us. Okay. It's uh, like I mentioned, it's a 30 minute video. Um, and I will request you all to give you 100% attention to it. Um, uh, okay. And please make notes uh, to every key point that is mentioned. Uh, I believe it's, it, it's, it's a wonderful teaching. Um, so yeah, here we go. Let me go ahead and share the screen. Yeah. Is that cool? Everybody okay with that? Some of you are like, do I have a choice? <laughs> All right, here we go. You know, it's funny, I was thinking, when you, make, when you make your notes late at night or during worship, when it, you have this sound going and it's just so epic, you know? You know what I mean? At night, like everything's so epic and then you do a 345 session and then you look through your notes and it, they're not, they're different. It doesn't quite, doesn't quite have that music backdrop and that feeling. So I'm not gonna try to recreate the feeling of I felt when I wrote these out. So some of this might be amazing and some of it might not be. So we'll, we will see. Um, but prophetic worship, I, I actually changed, I, I typically would talk about certain things relating to prophetic worship, but um, last night and today, I kind of changed things up a bit. Corey touched on a bit of it, which was really good. Amazing communicator. And um, I want to, it's, it, some of this might feel like a little bit of a poke, a little bit intense. Some of it might feel negative, but um, I think um, just for me personally, like a lot of times people, communication's a big deal. And as, and as leaders and as prophetic songwriters and worshipers, communication is everything to us, you know, hearing and then being able to communicate it so it's clear. So just to set myself up, when I had my collapse or whatever, breakdown two years ago, I'm very passionate about being forward with things. And some of you follow me on social media, I'm, I'm going to be better moving forward, I promise, because I have, a, I have, there's a reason. I want to infiltrate those worlds and blow them up from the inside out. But anyways, it's a, it's a joke, but also true. But... <laughs> When I went through my thing, I was faced with something that comfort did not fix. Comfort didn't, get, didn't fix me, didn't get me out of it. It was blunt truth that the Lord himself threw my way. And so I had to face things head on, like a lot about what Jason talks about, and pull myself up by the bootstraps and commit to things I didn't want to. You know what I mean? So a lot of what I'm going to say today is just, it's not... Um, it's not coming from a place of, of like harshness from my heart. It would be coming from a place of like, I really feel like this is true. And I really feel like this is going to be helpful if we do this. So just, just so you, to be clear. But you can look bored and you can look tired and that totally it's fine. I'm not going to need you to disengage. I'm just going to read a bunch and then try to fill in the blanks in between, okay? Now that I wasted four minutes... <laughs> Um, I'll start with this. It is our responsibility as worship leaders or prophetic worship leaders to posture ourselves like pastors and prophets to the people. A pastor prophet can see a destination, which is a prophetic role, and also how to lead the people to that destination. A pastor prophet can see a destination, but that's not enough. God's called us to be prophet pastors. But, in, but to know how to communicate, to know how to lead people to that destination. 
Prophetic worship is, at its foundational level, spirit-directed and spirit-empowered. John 4, 23 through 24 talks about that. Praise is prophetic when it is directed and empowered by the Holy Spirit to accomplish God's now purpose for our lives or a particular meeting. I feel like the Lord wants us to go from thermometers to thermostats. Now, a lot of you have heard this before. It's a great picture of what we are called to be. Thermometer is what? It's something that takes the temperature of a room, right? In our culture, in our day, it's easy to be a thermometer and just go, yep, it sucks or it's good. Or like Chris the other day was so funny. He goes, that guy that just goes on there and goes, disappointed. That's so good. Because it's easy to take that route and just go, I give it a five or whatever and just become the judge of all things. And, and those of you who know me, like that's, that's like my default is to become the judge of all things. It's kind of a joke there. Um, but the Lord, but I feel like, you know, there comes a point in time in each one of our lives where we get so tired of that, that God calls us to step out and become the thermostat. And what's a thermostat do? You actually set the temperature in the room. You actually take on the responsibility as a leader, submitted under his rule, and you take on the responsibility of setting the temperature in the room. And I feel like as prophet, pastor, musicians, that's what God, that's why you're here at the school. God's called you to take on that responsibility. And it's really important. It's not enough to be a thermometer. Feelings, let's talk about feelings. Feelings are your best friend and also your worst enemy. Feelings are your best friend and also your worst enemy. Feelings are what gives us insight into a reality, but not necessarily the reality. A reality, but not necessarily the reality. Feelings can give us a heads up, but not always the truth. Feeling out a room and singing a prophetic song is what we do as prophet musicians. But taking the pulse of a room or your own heart and stating the obvious is not the way to beat the devil. We should take the pulse and if needed, speak the opposite overarching truth that trumps the smaller truth. It's stating the eternal truth, not the temporal truth. Just like in prophecy, you combat the darkness over someone by speaking the opposite. You speak the greater reality versus the lesser reality. Yes, you might have cancer, but it is not the will of the Lord. So the greater reality is to speak out his reality. Prophecy, as Corey was saying, prophecy is to edify, exhort, and comfort, not just to state the obvious, feeling in a room. If someone is depressed, it's not enough to say, I feel like the Lord is saying you're depressed. <laughs> Yet we do this all the time when it comes to worship and prophetic song. What is God saying or singing about the depression? Sing that. That is what prophecy is. You see where I'm going with this? So we're caught in a thing where, and I love it because I love it when, 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 like, when like they said. I just want to rewind that a little bit. About his reality. Prophecy, as Corey was saying, prophecy is to edify exhort and comfort, not just to state the obvious, feeling in a room. If someone is depressed, it's not enough to say, I feel like the Lord is saying you're depressed. <laughs> Yet we do this all the time when it comes to worship and prophetic song. What is God saying or singing about the depression? Sing that, that is what prophecy is. You see where I'm going with this? So we're caught in a thing where and I love it because I love it when, 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 like, when, like they said, put your antenna up. When, when your antenna up and you're, 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 you're for me, is you know, you're leading worship and you get something, right? And it's just like so exciting because you're like, or you walk into a room and you feel something. You're like, it just makes you feel like you're in tune. Like God is showing you something. That's why we're alive. It's like our connection to God is everything to us as prophet musicians. It's our best friend. It is our best friend, and we need to hunger for it. We need to learn how to feel out of room. I'm not trying to dumb that down at all. And the only reason I'm saying all this is because I've, we've all done this. I've done this. I probably did it the other day. It, it is what we have to work against. 
Um, where was that? Let's take it a step further. Singing out what your issue is over a crowd will cause a connection. Now, here's this is interesting. I've been I've been kind of thinking about this for years, just kind of trying to figure this out. Even with me, when I step out in prophetic song, or what I would think to be prophetic song, singing out what my issue is over a crowd will cause a connection in the people in the room who have the same issues. That doesn't mean it's right or it's prophetic. For instance, there's a massive need for significance in the world right now. So if we sing about our feelings of insignificance, we will automatically have a large group of people in the audience right there with us. Or even better, on the floor crying with us or hugging each other and crying. Everyone connecting over the same issues in a room isn't the goal of the prophetic song. The reality of what is happening is they are just connecting with your pain and you to theirs. Now, I'll stop there because I want to kind of explain that a little bit more. And it's not a bad thing, but sometimes I feel like in our prophetic feeling is we, we feel something in the room, we feel a weight or we feel whatever, you know, we feel like right now tired, you know, that feeling. And we just, we aid that thing and we, and we almost give encouragement to that thing because I feel it too and you feel it. So therefore we're both feeling it together. So it must be the, you know what I'm saying? And it's not that it's bad, but prophetic is something that always births spiritual victory. In the Bible, when you read the Bible, all throughout the Bible, the prophetic song is that thing which birthed spiritual victory. Every prophetic song in the Bible caused breakthrough. It got people from point A to point Z. It got people's heads from down to up. It celebrated the God in people. When he was talking about Nathaniel, I love that story. How God views a cynic. And he goes, this man has no guile. This man has no BS. I love that story. We cannot keep people in their same patterns with our prophetic songs. We must give answers and truth if we open up those types of issues or cans of worms with our, with our prophetic songs. We've got to give them an out. We've got to give them, I look at it like this, like every song, every prophetic moment, it's like an anchor or, or, or like a life raft like a life raft. So whether you write a song or you sing out a prophetic song, think of it from that pastoral type of perspective. So, so I'm throwing out a life raft because there's people in the room right now that are literally out there swimming with no lifesaver and they're gonna die if they don't get a word from God, right? We've all been there. We've all been in places in our lives where if we don't get a word from God, man, we're done, right? And there's nothing wrong with saying it, like Jesus said. There's nothing wrong with admitting it and just being open. So a lot of our prophetic is that, giving someone a life wrap. And a lot of our prophetic too is just the spark that ignites an already existing flame into like a f- f- furnace of, of more passion. God's destiny for our lives is so much bigger and greater than what we perceive or even know. So prophetic is always that pastor or like throwing out life rest, throwing out another, another spark, encouragement to the people um, in the room or listening to your albums or whatever. <clears throat> uh, this is an interesting one. Favor allows a person the people's ears, the people's heart, the people's trust, whether we speak truth or not. This is a scary thing. So like me, let's say I'm up here and I've gained enough favor in your eyes, enough authority to where you believe I'm a believable. Maybe my anointing overarches my ability to communicate truth. You know what I'm talking about? You ever see someone, they're so anointed, but if you actually, actually listen to what they're saying, you're like, I'm not so sure that that's, do you know what I'm saying? But you believe it because you're like, that's, they're, they're anointing. They're, they have a charisma about them, a God-given charisma that is bigger than actually their character or, or, or their biblical or their theology. We all know what we're talking, right? Yeah. Coffee shop theology. It's words without actually standing up to live is what's going on there. Um, so it's a scary thing to be, to write a song and then get a bunch of momentum and favor and then apparently everything you say is true. That's kind of what happens. I know that's happened for me. 
Um, people are attracted to passion, but not necessarily truth. Passion can be mistaken as freedom, which is what everyone wants in their lives. Everyone wants to feel free to be who they're called to be, therefore causing people to think what you're saying or seeing is truth. It's just a scary place to be, which is why like Corey was talking about a lot of biblical roots, biblical foundation about what the prophetic song is for, how it originated. It's important that we're reading the word and we're being filled up the right way. Social media threads don't count as reading the word, in my opinion. I'm telling myself that. I'm on day three of no social media. It's wonderful. It's great. I'm like, oh, I, I could, I don't know if I'll ever go back. A generation that wants answers and solutions that don't involve faith is part of our issue. Our entire existence, everything we're built on, everything we are is built on faith and so should our prophetic songs be. I think our prophetic songs at at the core need to build faith. They need to not only build faith in the people, but cause people to have to step out in faith. Everything we believe in this life is because of faith. The enemy fights against our faith and confidence full time. Believing your beliefs and doubting your doubts. Levi Lusko said that, and I love that. Believe your beliefs and doubt your doubts. We need to get a backbone. Us leaders need to be intentional and fight against the thing that cause. Us leaders need to be intentional and fight against the thing, that thing, because people are listening to us. Sorry, I didn't quite write that out right, but whatever. I kind of made it work, I guess. <laughs> um, I, th I believe like one of the enemy's greatest tactics against prophet musicians is, is confidence. Um, I feel like if he could steal your confidence, he's somewhat won the battle. And therefore, I think it's important that we spend the majority of our time as prophetic musicians, creative artists who are bent towards sensitivity. Sensitivity can be amazing, a strength of yours, but it also can be your greatest weakness. Being sensitive, being a sensitive person sometimes can be looked at as weaker or feminine. Sensitive, oh, that guy's sensitive. You know what I mean? Or that girl's sensitive. It, it almost, it's almost, and I joke around about it, to be honest with you. And I joke around about it because I try not to, I don't want to give into the negative part of what that is. Sensitive is our greatest ally. It's that thing in us that allows us to walk into a room and be able to feel a room out like we were talking about. It's, it allows us to receive and then respond to the Holy Spirit. It allows us to create. You realize that we create out of, because of what we, we receive. We can't worship, we can't even begin to worship God unless we get a revelation of God. So our sensitivity is everything to us. But if the enemy can come against our confidence, make us feel insecure, make us feel unsure, I feel like half that battle's won, especially when it comes to us singing out the word of God, prophetic song over his people. If you're singing out from a root of insecurity, you're not only doing yourself injustice, but you're doing the body of Christ injustice. Yeah. You're doing the church injustice. That sounds like really intense, I know. It's downer. We need to be intentional and fight against that. Intimacy with God fixes insecurity. I really feel that our time with the Lord is so important not that it's more important than the normal average person. And I don't even like that we do that. We say, oh, they're just a normal average person and I'm a creative artist, so therefore I can be this way. I don't even like how we do that. It just kind of happens. But as someone whose job is to somehow feel what God's saying and then put it in a poetic song form, that is a reality. And we need to be so rooted in God so that when you get up in front of people, your song, your life, your leadership isn't tainted by unsure, insecurity, um, feelings of inadequacy. Because two things will happen. You'll, you'll, you'll overcompensate 
to try to fight against that thing and it can come across as arrogance or you will I would say undercompensate and you'll cower and you won't step out when God's wanting you to step out. Two things happen. Imagine the church at large, the church, the body of Christ, imagine the church singing over themselves every week or learning to sing over themselves every week. So in leading, I think it's important to train the church to sing themselves into freedom. A lot of times we take on the posture of, um, We are the prophetic voices. We are the prophetic musicians that our job is to sing freedom over the people. We're the saviors. But I think as leaders, we need to be training the church to sing themselves into freedom, creating moments in our worship sets where it's just a one and a four, or maybe a six, four, one, five, or maybe a one sus, back to the one. And you allow moments, and you you, you encourage the people to sing out your own song, or your own prophetic song, or even better, sing out in the spirit. Sometimes I try that, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You go, sing out in the spirit and nothing happens and then maybe try it again. Sing out in the spirit or sing out your own song, put his name on your lips. And what'll happen is people need to learn how to pull up themselves up by their own bootstraps. And unless we create an intentional space for that in our worship times where people can actually realize, like sing over themselves and actually feel the effects of what that does to their lives, a lot of times they'll always wait for you to sing for them. And the pressure that that puts on us on the stage is, I don't think it's right. I think it puts an unhealthy pressure because God's yoke is easy, his burden is light. But I'm telling you, man's yoke is not easy and it's not light. He's the only one that could take the weight of the world on his shoulders to the cross. We are, we are not meant to be able to carry that. So it is our job to train and teach the church to sing themselves out of their own funks, out of their own depression, out of their own delusion. Reminding themselves who God is. That's a lot of what we're supposed to do in prophetic worship. Reminding themselves and ourselves who God is. Singing out in the spirit or whatever comes to their mind in that atmosphere. Imagine a church that knows how to sing over themselves. Prophetic worship is one way that you can have a face-to-face meeting with God or provide a means for others to encounter Him. Prophetic praise and worship enables God's message to be brought or His purpose to be accomplished. In a worship setting, there's a strength in that we should strive for. A face-to-face encounter with God. It doesn't actually say presence in the Bible. Did you guys know that? It says face-to-face. Every time presence is there, it actually means face-to-face. Our prophetic worship should bring people into a face-to-face encounter with God. So much happens when, when a face-to-face encounter with God happens in a meeting. Years of counseling, years of heartache, years of despair, years of addiction can literally break off in a moment. Jason was talking about that. It can break off in a moment. And that's what the prophetic song is for. It's not just a nice sound. It's not just something we do if we can sing really good or we can play really good or we can make up words on the spot really quick. It's not what a prophetic song is or for, but this is what it's for. Corey was talking about, it's a, to, to bring people into breakthrough, the face-to-face encounter with God. Um, I thought of this the other day, if, and when leading worship, if I can't shake it, I sing it. Um, last Heaven Come conference, I remember in the middle of a worship set, I was just leading and and the word epilepsy just kind of like popped up on the screen, you know? And I couldn't shake it. So I just started singing about it in the worship set. As a lot of times like we do, you know, you just sing out something and take a risk and then something happens great, nothing and whatever. Um, And one year later, this was just on the last tour, a guy came up to me, a 21 year old kid came up to me and he said, hey, when you sang out that epilepsy thing at the Heaven Come conference, God healed me. So a year later, I got to see what that one little step. So if I can't shake it, I sing it. If you're going in a worship set and you got a theme or an idea or you woke up in the morning with a thought in your head, pay attention. Pay attention to everything that surrounds a worship set because I feel like God's wanting to speak to you and through you more than you even realize. And a lot of times I miss it because I'm just not vulnerable to his presence. My antenna's not up like Corey was saying. And it's really that simple. Pleasing God usually feels vulnerable and humbling in the moment when it comes to stepping out in prophetic worship. 
We must become confident in God more than our gifting, whether big or small. Most of us rely on God for what we think we are weak in and not so much what we think we are gifted in. So if I can come up with melodies or lyrics on the spot, the temptation is to push cruise control on and rely on my gift to carry me through the moment. But the prophetic song the Lord has for us is the kind that comes when we partner our gifting with his. It goes from good to otherworldly, and that is what a broken world needs. God wants to partner with us. I think it's important that we realize it has nothing to do with our gift, whether big or small. It's just partnering with him. Some of the greatest men and women of God that we would look at and say they've got the greatest gifting didn't start there. It started as a weak little offering and God turned it into a massive strength. <clears throat> Prophets need to be the most confident people around, people who know how to partner with God, people who know their place in God. Are we building faith in God's people with our prophetic songs are we feeding their um, or are we feeding their unbelief? Our songs should be so full of hope they ignite a fire in the people who are facing the hardest, most impossible circumstances in life. They should feel the sense that the sky is the limit with God in every one of our worship sets. Wouldn't that be good? Faith should always be the backbone, the foundation, the cornerstone of our prophetic songs. Prophetic praise celebrates the fulfillment of God's promises before they are manifested in the natural realm. Prophetic praise penetrates the atmosphere and pushes back oppression, apathy, fear, and all other effects of spiritual warfare. For Samuel 10, one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible, it says, Saul turned into another man in prophetic praise. I think he was turned into the man God intended him to be. And this is what our prophetic song should be doing in our churches and gatherings turning and shaping his church into who God originally intended them to be. We have that power, that authority, that mantle that God's given us prophet, pastor, musicians to sing people into existence. With each passing of our songs, it'd be like a, a flame that ignites the thing in them that God is wanting to be ignited. <clears throat> Let me just look through here, make sure I didn't miss anything. You guys did good, by the way. You didn't look too, you didn't look too tired, but. Um, so I think just the heart behind this as I'm wrapping up is um, viewing prophetic as not just a nice little song or that we sing in a worship set, but also from a pastoral perspective, equipping the church to sing over themselves, creating space for them to step out and sing. And um, it less being about me coming up with something in front of people and more stewarding a moment like Corey was saying together collectively hearing what the what's going on in the crowd and coming into some of the best moments in worship are that which we stop singing and we just start playing and people just start singing and responding to God with nothing on the screen and no leader leading them the further we get into worship set the less we should actually have to lead people and they just start erupting in that Tehillah song of praise, the song with the breath of the spirit on it starts to just come out of his one by one, the people. And then eventually everyone in the room is singing out their own song to God. And I don't know about you, but those moments, those are what we live for as worship leaders, as prophetic musicians. We live for those moments. It's the empowering moments for the church. And I always hear feedback when those, those moments happen. Those are the moments where that, 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 Bob Jones says, that's when the angels come, that tehila, the high praise of God. That's when the angels come. That's the praise that God promises in Psalms to inhabit. It's the prophetic praise that he promises to inhabit. So as you go and you write your songs and you're leading, and, and as we're leading up here, just remembering um, what is prophetic worship? It's not just a song or a spontaneous moment. There's so much more to it. Prophetic worship, worship, there's a result, there's breakthrough, there's victory that follows the prophetic song. All right, Lord, thank you for this time. Bless it. Amen. So simple and straightforward, huh? Right. Uh, look, I realized that, uh, you know, he made a lot of points and pretty fast as well. 
Uh, but what's good is uh, this is a recorded and it will be out there. So if you want to watch it again, it's available for you to watch it, right? Um, so that's a good thing. Uh, but uh, was there something that you could take off that video, learn from the video? Uh, some uh, some points that you made a note of. Uh, yeah, yeah, too much to take it one go. Yes, but then something on the fly you caught. Uh, now this is not available on YouTube uh, here. Uh, but what this recorded because it's uh, I mean this session is recorded and it will be reposted in the stream section so you can watch it. A couple of years ago, like most of you all are doing, I did an online course. Yeah, that's all about those videos. Um, yeah, but uh, quickly, you all want to uh, share what some of the one liners that. Uh, yeah, Nikki, go ahead. I think, the, uh, obviously, like I said, there was too much, and I wish yeah. we could go back. I wanted to tell you, like, rewind, rewind. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's few things I think apart from what he said the, one of the main things which kind of was really spoke to me was where he said people are attracted to passion and your favor can actually cause people to go astray which is of course he phrased it differently but yeah, yeah, yeah. I noted it down here which is scary to think about like yeah. when you depend so much on uh, just you just go leaning on your flesh and yeah. not in the spirit yeah. and that is something I definitely learned and I want to teach to others as well yeah so yeah it that is. was one of the main things I took back yeah that is too deep and profound isn't it uh, just, yeah, yeah just think and meditate and re-meditate on it uh, but yeah because passion is so misleading um, yes, yeah Any, anybody else yeah Divya thank you for sharing Yeah. Yes, Divya, that's Brian Johnson. Yes, yes. Thermostat versus thermometer. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, God's calling us to be a thermostat, as in, as in we call to set the temperature uh, you know, in the room or change the atmosphere in the room. As worshippers, our worship should change the atmosphere. Isn't it a little bit like what we saw uh, the woman with the alabaster jar does is when she breaks uh, her act of worship, she fills the room with a fragrance, a fragrance of worship. So, uh, you know, I, what happens is the atmosphere changes. Uh, everything changes in that atmosphere. So uh, we are called to be something like that. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. I think it might help somebody who, uh, who, who would have missed out at some points. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Divya has pasted some of her notes. Uh, feel free to take it. Um, yeah. Anybody else? Uh, let, me, let me just quickly read what uh, the has me. Uh, prophetic songs, birth, victory, every prophetic song, like the jacket, we need to go after the truth and not only passion. Our prophetic songs should be built out of faith and the prophetic songs would inspire faith. Being sensitive allows us to be receptive to the Holy Spirit. And the enemy tries to come against our faith, against our confidence. We need to be intentional. Uh, where, where is that? Okay. We need to be intentional to fight against this. Our time with the Lord is pivotal. We can train ourselves to sing over our lives based on the Word of God. Encourage people to sing out in the Spirit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Divya. Uh, yes, Nikki. So I just had a question, if I can ask a question. Sure. So with regard to, I think, you know, most of the time I'm not a worship leader. I've just been playing music, which I enjoy in the background. But uh, playing with quite a few worship leaders, I see there's a lot of difference in their leading. Yeah. And I I just wanted to get a idea of like I personally feel that when people start off with a set list and then go into prophetic praise 
from my point of view it always seems like the congregation flows better with that yeah. versus i see some worship leaders who just go straight into prophetic praise but they're sometimes standing alone right. and uh, i i could never figure that out because i'm not leading of course yeah it's i trust the worship leader on what they are doing yeah. but could you shed some light on that on why that happens or is there something to it uh sure yeah um i mean there's two aspects to it uh from my at least from my experience uh i mean then it could be okay one of the negative aspect of it could be uh, a lack of experience or exposure uh you know critical thinking or critical decision making um i understand what you're talking about um so here's the thing right in my experience uh so there is a house of prayer you, you you know you know face to face uh in 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 bangalore where we i lead worship a lot um, so the atmosphere there is very different for example uh you know um like the audience are different but the band members are different so everything is different there, right um so there is this, there is this different sense of freedom there is different uh, options of i mean different people Uh, that you are catering to that you're ministering to so you have the liberty uh, and you're not again going like for example if you're lead, if i'm leading worship at face to face in the house of prayer i'm not going to start off with something uh like unplanned for the sake of starting off with something that's unplanned uh you know but if i do feel led to start off with something that we did not plan um because of the atmosphere because of a, like you know that place uh the audience and the team that i have i have the liberty to go that way like take risks and go that way but i would not do that in a church setting like apc uh and at, in a church setting this is where i'd like to like you said uh, what i would also prefer is you plan and then you know uh move into the prophetic half a midway through the set and what not so um at at a church like apc or any church for that matter um unless i gauge the audience i would not start off with something that is not planned uh, maybe a small chorus in the beginning like for example last sunday uh the first song was more upbeat the benai which i had to lead but then i just sang a chorus of oh come let us adore uh, you know like a couple of times before we went into the first song i think that is okay not because i led uh, i think that's okay because it's a familiar chorus um, and uh, you know not everybody was playing it was just very simple chords uh, so that was that is okay so and i think it's very important and i say maturity and uh, experience and exposure comes with you understanding the uh, people that you are ministering to that you are serving to um you know in church like again like apc there are young people there are middle aged people there are older people there are people from different backgrounds methodist baptist some pentecostals etc that's the history of our church isn't it so uh so knowing the history of the congregation that you are ministering to uh is very important and that's in my opinion so you're not going full on prophetic for the sake of going prophetic uh you know but like brian johnson he said that it is our responsibility to teach the church about the prophetic as well uh, you know so they know what you are doing uh, etc uh yeah and this i'm not sure if you know this uh, worship leader called jeremy riddle uh, and i quote this to my team all the time he said uh, prepare like it depends on you but lead like it depends on god um so yeah we prepare as a team we put the songs together and then we are just being sensitive you know our antennas are up to what see what god is doing in the room and yeah thank you you're yeah, welcome yeah i mean i've also been in places where you know i have to i feel like starting off with completely different song even in places like a house of prayer uh but then i also know my musicians and if i know that their ear is not good their musical skill is uh is is not at the level where i uh you know where if they, if they're not able to handle that particular song i would not do it because it would 
the whole point of the prophetic or going spontaneous is to serve better, isn't it? And uh, and if we don't serve better by by playing the wrong chords, it's just no point, isn't it? So, yeah. Thanks for that question, Nikki. Okay, guys. Uh, Thanks, Priya. Um, anything else? Anybody else? Before we take a break. Okay. All right. Uh, but as mentioned, guys, so this video will again, you know, will be available for you to watch it again. Uh, so feel free to do that. Make points, notes. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, Vika, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Pastor, to interrupt. I was just uh, thinking about uh, that video in which uh, he was telling about a particular word came to his mind, like epilepsy. And maybe one year after he he got to hear the you know testimony. So I, I was just curious to know, like, had you ever had such an experience, like, while you lead, uh, were leading the worship? You had... Mm, because Pastor Ashish would always do the, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, not, so for me, it's been more of uh, this word intimacy has come. That, that's what I could think of. Uh, like, I've, during moments of worship, uh, leading worship, I felt that uh, very strongly that, uh, so these were two words, intimacy and deeper uh, is, so and I release it. God is calling someone. Uh, it was actually in a life group, uh, you know, in a leading worship. And I felt like God was calling someone to a deeper levels of intimacy. And I released that, and uh, you know, just went on. So it was later during the week, midweek. Uh, my life group leader messaged me saying that hey, there was this person who actually said that when you release that word, uh, it was for him, and God's been calling that person to deeper levels of intimacy. Um, so yeah, that's there's been moments like that, but not necessarily in terms of uh, healing. That's actually it's never happened to me. Like uh, you know, in the middle of a worship set for praying for someone with pain and whatnot. But I have seen other worship leaders release that though. Yeah, it's uh, happened to me. <laughs> Okay, okay, Master, thank you. That's, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah, but uh, I felt like last time, was it the last week uh, when Pastor Rashish was seeing you, you were telling about a pain in the leg? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was, <laughs> it's amazing. How, okay, I, I forgot about it. <laughs> uh, so there was this warmth in my feet, uh, you know, when um, during the ministry time towards the end. Uh, it was very unusual. It, it, things like that just don't happen to me. And, um, you know, there's this thing called the risk factor. Uh, you know, you know, there's something unusual that doesn't just happen. And you just got to take that risk, be obedient. It's like, okay, just release it as, you know, um, I just, uh, just went ahead and releases release that word uh, if, and I was not even sure like if it was something to do with the ankle or just the feet and whatnot I haven't received any testimony back uh, but yeah that's was uh, pastor uh, sorry to interrupt uh, this week there was a testimony about the uh, pain getting healed uh, there was a testimony about the calf muscle pain getting oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I got that email. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, they would have pain all through the night, and uh, yeah, I got okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you were talking also about an addiction, which later on Pastor Ashish confirmed, like uh, somebody yeah. is taking sleeping pills. Yeah, yeah, that was amazing too. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, awesome. Uh, yeah, praise God. But yeah, I, I mean, uh, like everything that we've learned in the previous chapters, uh, you know, every now and then kind of happens in it. Uh, and the thing is, uh, is look, guys, I'll just quickly share on, on this and I'll let you go for a break, okay? 
so i have this friend of mine okay who happens to be a very hey, best friend if still anybody has that uh, he has unusual encounters with the lord like unusual and i've known him since i was 17 years old and i'm 34 i just confessed my age and on the recording <laughs> um i've known him for a long time that's the point but for the time that i've known him he he's had supernatural encounters with the lord like he sees things uh he sees the you know angels and throne room and what not and i'd be right next to him i like where is it what is why am i not seeing anything uh you know <laughs> and he would release a certain prophetic words that i'd be like what is happening you know i i pray with him too i said it <laughs> but there was a season where you know i would hunger and thirst for an encounters like that you know to be used by god like that but there was also very slightly a chance of me getting offended is like why am i not getting you know you, do you understand what i'm talking about i uh like there was this part in me is like why is it not happening to me lord is there something wrong that i am doing but i will i never forget this moment okay there was a worship team that came from the us from international house of prayer to one of the meetings and uh, they were praying for people and i went i went you know forward and there was this person who was playing the guitar he laid his hands on me um and he said uh you know god is pleased with you uh don't be offended by the fact don't don't be offended that's all he said i'm like what <laughs> um so if god is releasing certain words certain encounters to certain people and if it's not happening to you through you i uh, don't be offended by the fact uh, it's not thing wrong with you uh, or god he wants to use you more than you you know you you ever know uh, but just keep your heart in check and keep pursuing him uh, you know because we don't pursue him only for the gifts isn't it we pursue him because he's a good father and you want to love him um so just love on him just continue to love on him and that's one of the most beautiful important lessons i've ever learned in my life is to not be not to be offended by the fact that god is not using you or you're not having the supernatural encounters um it's okay our job as worshipers is to just love on him just to continually break our alabaster jar at this feet and the rest is up to him Okay that's the end of my rant uh I'll stop the recording uh, for now and we can go all go for a break